All right, I had put together this sermon. It was um, while my dad was still in the hospital that I was able to work on it. And um, after reviewing it, how it's just amazing the way the Lord works and um, how appropriate for me uh, that today's subject matter is. And I pray that it will be a blessing to you. Jesus gives us assurances and promises throughout the Bible. And uh, what we'll discuss today, you could call three promises. But um, for these three things, I, I prefer the, to call them three blessed assurances. And... Um, those assurances we find in John, the 16th chapter, and the 33rd verse. And this is what it says. It says, These things I have spoken unto you, that ye might have peace. That ye might, in me, that in me ye might have peace. have to make sure I get that in there. Start over. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So here in this verse we have three basic assurances that uh, Jesus tells us that we, um, we are going to have. And this is, uh, if you read the chapter, this particular verse uh, follows where Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to have to leave them, but he's going to send the comforter. Uh, he tells them that they're, they're going to be going through times of trouble and, and persecution, and that even to the point that they will deny him and that they will leave him high and dry. Yet, after he says all that, he says this. He says, I've told you all these things so that in the end you might have peace in me. That you might know for certainty that in this world you're going to have troubles and tribulations, sorrows and heartaches. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. So we move on into our subject matter. There are three basic assurances here in one verse. The uh, first assurance that we uh, come across is that in this world, we are going to have tribulations. We are going to have trouble. We are going to have problems. There's no way to get around it. And some, there are times in everyone's life when it seems like the problems are just overwhelming. That it's a never-ending cascade of one thing after another. And I can tell you personally over the past two years that... Uh, I just keep waiting for the next shoe to drop and um, I just keep praying that I that we'll have a break for a little while <laughs> and I feel in my heart that that we'll have a little break for a while here I had um, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret I had been mentally trying to prepare myself for the loss of uh, some of our elderly within the church, um, for Sister Joanne and for Opal, and and um, had been trying to mentally prepare myself for the loss of of my parents as they're 
getting on in years and but the truth is you can try to prepare your head all you want to for troubles and heartaches and grief and sorrow you cannot prepare your heart there's no way on our own power that we can have the strength to go through and deal with what life throws at us. And that's what makes these assurances from Christ so very special. In the world, we are going to have trouble. Sometimes a lot of trouble. Sometimes one trouble after another. Overwhelming troubles. But we can still have peace in the depth of our soul. No matter how much turmoil is going on on the surface, down in the depth of our soul, we can have total and complete peace inside. And uh, that peace, Jesus described it when he said, it's a, a peace that passes the understanding of this world. It's a kind of peace that rests within the heart of a believer that the world cannot even comprehend. And if you, if you are not a part of it, if you're not a child of God, and if you don't have the hope that I talked about earlier, then um, you just cannot possibly comprehend how people can go through the kinds of troubles that they go through and yet still remain at peace within. And as you all know, uh, one of the things that I'm fond of saying when people ask me how I'm doing, sometimes I just have to say, it is well with my soul. Because there are some times when the head ain't right, the heart is heavy, but it is still well with my soul. And so with these assurances, we can make sure that it stays that way. And the next assurance that is in that verse is victory. Victory. We are promised by Jesus Christ that we have the victory over all things. Why? Because Jesus already overcame all things. He says, in that verse, he says, be sure of this. In your life you will have troubles. Yet in me you will always find peace. And then he, at the end of that verse, he says, the reason that we have that peace is because he has overcome the world. So we'll go through those things um, one at a time here, the three teachings that we find in, in this verse of Scripture. Uh, tribulations, which are troubles, trials, temptations, grief, sorrows, loss, fear, you name it. Anything that troubles your mind and uh, disturbs your emotions. So basically troubles, trials, temptations. We have the assurance, you know, that's an assurance. You're going to have trouble. The next one is peace. Peace simply means a sense of contentment and comfort. To be content and to feel at ease and to feel comforted even while there is utter chaos going on around you. And sometimes life seems like you're in the middle of a battlefield with artillery going off all around and people going crazy and... Uh, but with the Lord's help, we can be the one on that battlefield that remains steady and calm 
and has assurance of the victory that will come. And that victory is through Jesus Christ because Christ overcame all things on our behalf. He overcame everything first. He overcame every kind of trouble in order that we might have the peace that is promised and the victory that comes. He overcame death. He was crucified on the cross, died a gruesome death, but rose again on the third day and now sits on the right hand of God, making intercession for us constantly so that we might have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Jesus overcame Satan. At the moment on the, that He hung on the cross and He said those words, It is finished. In my mind, I picture the heel of Jesus' sandal smashing in Satan's face. Because it's at that moment that Satan lost all power over God's children. Now that doesn't mean Satan's not still in the world causing us trouble. But he's, he's causing the world trouble. The only way Satan can cause, if you're a child of God, if you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, the only way Satan can cause you trouble personally is if you allow him. If you allow him to get a foothold into your life, to open up a wedge inside your life, that's the only way he can trouble you. Otherwise, Jesus has already defeated him. And the Bible says all we have to do is resist him and he will run from us. You can look that up in the first chapter in the book of James. Resist the devil and he will flee from us. Okay, so in, the, in victory we have, it's because Christ overcame death, he overcame Satan, he overcame every temptation that is common to man and yet remained without sin. He even overcame worldly politics. Everybody was expecting Jesus to be a different kind of Messiah. They were expecting him to be a great warrior who would fight their battles for them and, and lead them out from under the tyranny of the Romans and anybody else that was, had bugged them over the generations. But Jesus came first to save our souls. And then, later on, comes the victory for our bodies. Later on comes the resurrection, the transformation, and the new life. All right, so let's go through these um, one at a time here. Um, there is an assurance from Jesus Christ that we will be involved in tribulations, Troubles, trials, temptations. Uh, we can still have that peace. I must have put that in twice. Go to the next one. Okay, tribulation or troubles. There is a saying, success and contentment are too soon forgotten whenever we encounter life's troubles. Success any success and contentment that we may have at this particular moment in time can be all too soon forgotten when something drastic happens, whenever life's troubles enter into our living. It's like right now we're sitting here and everybody's calm, but if there was an earthquake of 3.5 or higher, there might be a little chaos in the room. Wouldn't mean that the world was over. Wouldn't be anything that this building wouldn't withstand. But it would shake things up a bit, right? Jesus gives us an assurance. 
every now and then, your life is going to get shook up a bit. And when that happens, we can react one of two ways. We can be like the little hen who ran around saying the sky was falling. Or we can have peace and contentment. In Jesus Christ. And God, uh, let me explain to you that God allows tribulation to come into our life. You know, people so often, you hear it all the time. If God loves us so much, why does he allow all these bad things to happen? And what's worse to me is the people who believe that God causes bad things to happen. And if you read also in the book of James, you understand that God is, God does not do anything bad. God does not bring any evil upon his, his people, upon anybody. God is good. God is love. He is incapable of doing any harm to any of us. Why? Because he is good and righteous and just. And the Bible straightly tells us that God is not tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. So when troubles come our way, it's not God's fault. And it's God is not the source of it. Troubles come into our life in the form of, uh, I have to put a small disclaimer there, God will use troubles that come into our life for chastening. Chastening basically means, uh, it's like when you get a whipping. But what it really is, is just, Discipline and direction from God. You see, not every child has to be whipped in order to receive discipline and direction. And um, in fact, in the world we live in now, if you whip your children and uh, if you decide not to spare the rod, uh, you could get into a lot of trouble. There are effective ways to discipline and direct our children without beating them in anger. And uh, I, I always went by the principle that the only time a child should be disciplined is when they directly challenge our authority. Because that's the only time God disciplines us. The only time he disciplines us is when we directly challenge his authority in some way. So troubles can come into our life as a result of our own foolish actions. And the Lord needs to discipline us and direct us. Get us going back on the right direction. Troubles can come into our life out of persecution. This is what Jesus was uh, in this chapter trying to describe to his disciples was that they were going to be persecuted because they were his followers. And if you are a follower of Christ, you are going to undergo persecution. There's no doubt about it. People are going to think of you a certain way. And people are going to treat you a certain way. And, uh, you know, a lot of times we think of persecution as such a negative word and such a negative thing. But in my mind, to be persecuted for being a Christian and for being a good example and a testimony to the world around me, to me, that's really not doesn't fall into my category of 
persecution. People can call me a Jesus freak. They can make fun of me. They can shun me. They can stop talking when I enter the room. It doesn't bother me. It did in the beginning. But it doesn't bother me anymore because I know why they're doing it. It's not because of me. It's because of who I represent. It's because they know that I represent God. And so if I suffer some persecution because I am called a Christian, and the word Christian, of course, means like Christ, Christ-like. We are learning to become more and more like Christ. If we suffer a little persecution for that, it is nothing compared to what Jesus suffered for us. All right, the next uh, thing I have on my list there is temptations. We suffer a lot in life. We suffer a lot of troubles and a lot of tribulations because of our own temptations. Because we are tempted towards sin. We are tempted to do that which is against God's will. And every time we do something that is against God's will, it has, the next on the list, consequences. There are always consequences for going against God's will. Why do we go against God's will if we know that there are such consequences that we're going to have to pay? The same reason children go against our will. Knowing full well that they're going to have to pay the consequences for doing something that is a, uh, we've d directly told them not to do, or we've taught them that they ought to do. And yet they challenge our authority consistently. Why do they, why do, they do that? Because of their selfish inner desire. Because a child has an innate selfish desire to be free from the authority of their parent. And because children have innate selfish desires to do whatever they want to do at any particular moment in time. And that doesn't change as we grow into adults. You know, we have children, every child has... Uh, certain things that a parent will have to deal with. Uh, some parents have to deal with a child who's who grab things, grabs things out of the market, puts them in their pocket on the way out, um, all the way up to having to deal with a child who uh, is a little older and gets involved with drugs and and other activities like that. It, the range is huge. And so it is among everybody on the planet that we all have selfish inner desires. We all have selfish evil desires. We all have desires to do things that go against what God has taught us that we ought to or ought not to do. And when we, when we go ahead and do something that we directly know is against God's will, we're going to suffer consequences for it, and we know it. And uh, it would be great if we would learn that what we endure for doing something that is against God's will is not worth the temporary pleasure of our evil desire. But that's why God has to chasten us. It's because it takes a, some of us are more hard-headed than others and it takes us a while to catch on. And uh, so there's, there's that, uh, the consequences of God, which are the form of chastening, persecutions that come from other people around us, and the temptations... Uh, just from living in a world filled with sin. And God allows troubles in our life. 
Jesus assured us, troubles come, will come in your life. God allows these troubles to come into our life to remove vanity or selfishness and encourage Christian growth. To remove vanity and encourage Christian growth. I can tell you from the from the troubles that I have been through over the past couple of years here, I am not the same person that I was two years ago. And I pray that I am such a better person. Because hopefully I have allowed God to use the troubles that have come into my life to shape me and to mold me, to make me more humble, to remove any residuals of my own power and my own strength and thinking that I'm smarter or better or more qualified or You see, because God has to remove all of that from us in order for us to become who we ought to be as Christians. We need to be humbled to the absolute extreme. And that's what happens when troubles take their toll in our life, is that we are humbled more and more and more over time. And this allows us, if we are in the Word and, and in prayer, it allows us to grow in Christ and become more of the person that God intended us to be. Instead of being stuck in the person that we don't like to be, we gradually become the person that God wants us to be. Okay, the next thing he said, even though there's going to, you're going to have trouble, troubles, tribulations, you can be at ease, you can rest assured that in me you will have peace. In Christ we will have peace, not by any other method. Not through yoga, not through meditation, not through books on psychology, but in Jesus Christ we can have peace. Even when the world is in absolute chaos, we can have contentment and comfort in the midst of life's problems. Jesus said that you might have, these things I have said to you, that you might have peace in me. That we might be at times lonely, but never alone because Jesus promised, lo, I am with you always. Family and friends can forsake us. Jesus never will. You know, there's a, that's an absolute in life. There's very few absolutes in life. You know, sociologists are fond of saying that the only absolute in life is change. Things will change, no matter what we do to try and keep them the, the same. But they neglect the Bible absolutes. And the Bible absolute says that there is a God and that He created all things and that He never changes and that He has established a way for us to live our lives more abundantly and that Jesus here gives us the promise that we can be at peace in the midst of great conflict and great troubles. So mankind will always let us down. Jesus never will. You can put your trust in human beings you're going to be let down every single time. Put your trust in Jesus. You will never, ever be disappointed. 
Okay, so family and friends may forsake us. Jesus never will. His divine nature supports our human spirit with comfort and the com in the form of the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And if you read this chapter, you read where Jesus also promised his disciples that the comforter would come after he left. The comforter being the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came, they would have comfort and contentment inside, even though they would suffer troubles and persecutions. So, the promised Holy Spirit, the Comforter, and that is the Holy Spirit, is God dwelling inside of us. How much greater comfort can we have as human beings than to know that God lives inside of us. At the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and takes residence inside of you. And you have access to power and grace and revelation and victory that you can never imagine before you receive it. Uh, so we have comfort, we have contentment, which is satisfaction, whatever. It's tough to learn to be content. When we as human beings are basically selfish and greedy, selfish, greedy, and power hungry, it's in our nature that we are, apart from Christ, we are selfish, greedy, and power hungry. And um, so learning to be content means allowing God to strip away a lot of the desires that are stuck in our head and in our heart. And some of the, uh, some of the big, one of the big things that holds us back is our desire to gain stuff. When we're young, we have this desire to just go out and just get stuff. And there's, you know, all the commercials on TV just tell you why you need this stuff and you got to have this and we have to have that and but after you reach a certain age somewhere between 40 and 90 years old depending on the person you realize that you have accum accumulated so much stuff that there's stuff you haven't seen in 20 30 years It's time at my house, it's time to start trying to give away stuff to the grandchildren. Here, you want stuff? Take. Take as much as you want. Got more stuff than I could ever use. But it, it doesn't matter. We always, no matter how old we get, we're always going to have a desire to gain something new. You know, even if it's you know, simple things. Um, everybody has a good knife in their drawer in their kitchen. But uh, if you go shopping and see a knife that you think is better, that will stay sharper and will do a better job, you're going to want to buy it. Even if you have the best knife already in your drawer. That's just human nature. But that's something that God needs to, to strip away from us, is that desire to just possess more and more stuff. You really see the ugly side of people, and I'm so thankful um, that I haven't had to deal with this yet, except with my sister last year. Um, when there's a death in the family, and the vultures of the family suddenly converge 
and want the stuff. Doesn't matter if it's junk or it's treasure. Everybody thinks they're entitled to something. To the stuff that's left over from somebody's life. And uh, after my sister passed away, I ended up with a lot of a lot more stuff at my house that I really didn't want to even bring home, but there was, it had to go somewhere. But thankfully, a lot of it, I just, her husband's relatives uh, were more than happy. In fact, they were exuberant in taking most of the stuff that was there. Uh, because they were stuff people. God has not yet stripped that away from them. See, the more we grow and the more we learn, the more we understand that the stuff we accumulate here on earth means absolutely nothing. We're not going to take it with us I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. Everything that we get, we just have to ha find a place to put. Before you know it, you've got so much stuff that you don't know what to do with. And, and everything we own, we have to maintain. So... Learning to be content and to be satisfied means understanding why we have possessions and what possessions we should have and learning to be content with what God has already given us. Many of us will never be content with what God has already given us because we're always looking forward to something better, something greater. We always want more, 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 more. We have to learn to be content with what God has already given us in order to be at peace inside. Also, contentment means having a sense of purpose. We all have an inner desire to be valued and respected by the people around us. But you can be valued and respected for the wrong reasons. So we have to learn how to be valued and respected as a person for all the right reasons. Because even a stripper is proud. She's proud of her body and she's proud of her dance and... But that doesn't mean we all want to be strippers, right? I would hope. We can learn to, to be valued and respected for the wrong reasons. A drug dealer feels he is valued and respected. But it's all with the wrong people and the wrong crowd, right? Right? He is certainly not valued and respected by society or by law enforcement. Not in the least. We have to learn to be valued and respected by God himself. To be valued and respected by other human beings because of who we are and the way that we live our life as Christians or being Christ-like. Okay, so we have the assurance that we're going to have troubles in our life, but in the midst of those troubles, we're going to have peace. We're going to have peace in Christ, not because of our own abilities, but because of the price that Jesus paid. Uh, we're going to have comfort and contentment a kind of peace that the world cannot even fathom, cannot even understand. And then finally, the victory. Jesus 
tells us that he has already overcome the world. He said, I have overcome the world. He has already won the victory over sin, over Satan, over self. And his victory is our victory. When we look at sin, we see that Christ overcame sin on our behalf. Christ overcame sin not for himself, not to show that he was better than us, not to show that he had uh, more willpower or or greater superpowers than us, and you know, which is what a lot of people believe that Jesus had superpowers, powers above mortal man. But the Bible teaches that he was. 100% man and 100% God at the same time, that he was tempted in every way like we are and yet remained without sin. So when we think about the fact that Jesus had victory over sin, you know, some people dismiss it. Well, he was God in the flesh. No wonder. But that's not the way it was. Jesus was a man, a human being, just like you and I. But because of the love that he had for the Heavenly Father and the love that he had for us, knowing that the life he lived on this planet was going to affect us thousands of years later, he chose to live a life without sin so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. Now that is amazing love. And that is a wonderful assurance. So we have the victory over sin, Satan and self, because Christ overcame on our behalf and he re remained without sin. He, he overcame every temptation, every selfish, evil lust that came towards him. He had the victory over it. He had the victory over every trouble that we can imagine as human beings. The consequences of sin, not his sin, the sins of others. You know, that's when we talked about consequences. A lot of times we deal with troubles in our life that are not our own consequences, but the consequences of what somebody else has done. And yet we end up getting the trouble for it. All right? Anybody have a brother or a sister, a bigger brother or sister that would do things and then you would get blamed for it? Or a younger brother and sister that would do things and you would get blamed for it? Same thing happens in adult life. Other people do stuff. The trouble comes on us. Jesus won the victory over sin. He won the victory over troubles. And most of all, he won the victory over that which we fear most as human beings. We fear death. We fear death because we don't know what's on the other side, for one. But mainly, we fear death because we know that at death comes a point at which we are going to have to be held responsible to God for what we have done with our life. Everybody knows it. Some people try to avoid it, but Romans, the first chapter, teaches that everybody knows that there's a God. Everybody knows that there's a God because you just look out at creation and see everything that's been created. You know that somebody had to do that. And if you know that there is a God, then you know that there's somebody that we are going to be held responsible and accountable to someday. So you know that there's going to be a judgment. That someday you will have to stand in front of God or in front of Jesus Christ and give an account for everything that you did in your life.
and everything you did with your life. And that's a lot of the reason that death is so scary to people. But Jesus even overcame death. He was killed, put into the ground, but on the third day he rose again and showed himself to the people who were there. Showed himself to the disciples. And then uh, later on, he showed himself a couple more times to, to many, many people. And today we know that he still lives and that he sits on the right hand of God with pow all power and authority. Why? Because he has all power and authority because he earned it. Because he lived a life that was without sin. He became the perfect sacrifice. And because he overcame. He won the victory. Over sin, over Satan, over self. He was willing to shed his precious blood. So that our sins might be covered. Therefore he is worthy to be called king of kings and Lord of Lords. So, Jesus won the victory over sin, over troubles, over death. Romans 6, 9 says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. As Christians, we should consider ourselves already dead to selfishness and to sin and alive to righteousness. In the same way that Jesus died to the earthly and rose again to the heavenly, we can learn to live a life that where we are dead to the old person we used to be and alive as new creatures in Christ. And that's the whole goal. Learning to become better people than we used to be. Learning to be prepared for the hope of our calling as Christians. So Christ has already overcame all things and he did it just for you. If there was no other person that ever lived, Christ would have still done it just for you. That amazes me. That is such a wonderful love. You know, it's something to think that Christ would do this for all of mankind, but even if you were the only person that God ever created, Christ would have done it just for you or just for me. That's the amazing amount of love that he has. And that's why we have such a great assurance in Christ for these, for these things. So in summary, Christ tells us that in life we are going to have troubles. There's no getting around it. You're going to have troubles. Sometimes little troubles, sometimes one trouble after another. But the peace of Christ will always carry us into that which is glorious. And that which is glorious is the victory that has been promised to all of us who have accepted God's gracious gift of salvation. Once you accept the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, then you have these blessed assurances that no matter how much trouble comes into your life, you can live your life in peace and contentment and satisfaction, knowing full well that the hope of your calling is stable because Jesus already won the victory for each and every one of us. Today, if you don't feel very victorious, then that's your own fault. <clears throat> Because the Bible tells us that Jesus has already given it to us. All we got to do is live in it. Let's stand together.
Finally, we have already overcome all things through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. We have already overcome all things because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A lot of us are holding back. A lot of us are still waiting for something more to happen. A lot of us are waiting for a greater revelation from God or a greater push from the Holy Spirit or something. <clears throat> But there's no need to wait. We can live in the victory of Jesus Christ right now, today. There's no, way, no reason to go away from here feeling defeated, feeling uh, tortured, feeling confused, feeling sad. We can go away from here in spite of what's going on around us in the world, totally at peace, and absolutely victorious because of Jesus Christ. Any word before we dismiss it?